we've all heard the term seeing is believing, right? Uh, there's an honesty to that. It could be a little irksome because we don't want to admit it, but it's, it's true. Oftentimes we have to see to ascertain something as being real, as being true. We argue with ourselves that we would otherwise be blindly trusting something, so we have to see it for ourselves. And the, the most popular example of this in the Bible, of course, is the so-called Doubting Thomas, right? So let's turn there for a second, John 20 and verse 24. John 20 and verse 24. Now Thomas called the twin, one of the twelve, was not with them when Jesus came. The other disciples therefore said to him, we have seen the Lord. So you ever want to say that to somebody, we have seen the Lord? We have seen these beautiful visions here in the church, right? We've, we, we know the holy days, we know what they picture, we know the beautiful things that God has planned. These people had it confirmed in front of them, right? We had this, they, they, had, they saw Jesus Christ after the resurrection, they saw him living proof. They saw everything confirmed. Jesus is the Messiah. Israel validated. Resurrection, all true. Wow. This, was, this was living proof. They saw him after his death. And so they said, we have seen the Lord. <clears throat> and for Thomas and for people that we might tell, I mean, the implications are profound, right? So Thomas says to them, <clears throat> to this group of, of disciples, this proto-church there, right? These first roots that are there. He says, unless I see his hands, the print of the nails, put my finger in the print of the nails and put my hand into his side, I will not believe. So he needs to touch, he needs to feel, he needs to see it, he needs to know for sure that this is true for himself, right? And we're at that point in history where the Bible, and James was, James Calanchus was speaking to this during the sermonette in terms of evolution, we're at a point here in history where the, where the Bible is considered a collection of morality tales, right? And increasingly, not even a good collection of morality tales, because the morality now, if you believe it, if you take it serious, right, you're either a fool at best, or increasingly so, you're a bigot, yes. right? You're a bigot instead. So the evidence, they want to demand the observable, the repeatable, right? The observable, the provable, the science, the cold hard facts. They need to see to believe. Not until the eighth day, as the Church of God teaches, not until the eighth day, the holy day, that last day, will the majority of people on this planet see God and see his truth, see the truth of Jesus Christ for the first time, right? Not until that. The vast majority will not know until then. Only first fruits, only the privileged few prior to that will understand the full truth. We'll see that. And his, they'll, they'll see Jesus. They'll have the validation through history, cosmology, true science, right? They'll have that, and they'll see peace for the first time. They'll see history for what it really was. And then they'll see the millennium. There's no peace. <clears throat> That's why I find it very interesting that in the next line here, verse 26, it says, and after eight days... His disciples were again inside, and Thomas with them. Jesus came, the doors being shut. See, on that eighth day, that's it. You're either going to accept Jesus Christ and that truth, or you're going to accept sin and death. I mean, there's, only, there's no, no two ways about it. And stood in the midst and said, peace to you. Then he said to Thomas, reach your finger here. Look at my hands. Reach your hand here. Put it into my side. Do not be unbelieving, but be believing. And Thomas answered and said to him, my Lord and my God. We believe in this church that the vast majority of human beings will say one day, my Lord and my God, yeah. right? How beautiful is that, right? Mm -hmm. I was told not to get sentimental, so I can't get sentimental. <clears throat> but they'll have that same reaction. For, the most, for most people on this planet, seeing is going to be believing. For most people on this planet, seeing is going to be believing. <clears throat> but Jesus says in verse 29, Thomas, because you have seen me and you have believed, blessed are those who have not seen and yet have believed. And truly Jesus 
did many other signs in the presence of his disciples, which are not written in this book, but these are written that you may believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, and that believing you may have life in his name. So it's a blessing to believe even though you haven't seen. And for first fruits, it's the ultimate blessing, right? Because it's the blessing of eternal life in the name of our Redeemer. <clears throat> but again, the vast majority have to see to believe. But I submit to you, right, that oftentimes what we believe for the, the reverse is even more true for people, right? What we believe determines oftentimes how we see the world, right? What we believe determines how we see the world. So what is it that we believe? <clears throat> and let's explore what I'm talking about biblically. Let's talk about the Apostle Paul for a minute. The Apostle Paul, he was up and coming in Judaism, right? He was being trained by the best in the word of God. The people who got the word of God and their descendants were training this person, Saul, at the time, not Paul. <clears throat> and let's see what he says here. Paul in Acts 22 and verse 3. Acts 22 and verse 3. He says, I am indeed a Jew born in Tarsus of Cilicia, but, but brought up in this city at the feet of Gamaliel, taught according to the strictness of our father's law, and was zealous toward God as you all are today. So he was zealous for God. He was a believer, right? He was a believer. <clears throat> but what did he see? Was he able to see God even though he was a believer? He was well trained in the law. He studied up. And then what? Verse 4. I persecuted this way to the death, binding and delivering into prisons both men and women, as also the high priest bears me witness, and all the council of elders for whom I also received letters to the brethren, and went to Damascus to bring in chains even those who were there to Jerusalem to be punished. Look at the words that he's using, binding, into prisons, in chains, to be punished. This was a man who was a religious believer, a religious believer. If this man can't get it right, what makes us think we can this is a question I'm asking, and let's take a look at what biblically is the answer to this. <clears throat> we say that people see what they believe, so what's the problem here? There was something wrong with how he was believing, right? Something wrong with his believing. It's not just what, it's not just that we believe. Plenty of people believe in God. How do we believe? Let's answer that question. <clears throat> he believed, he was persecuting what? He was persecuting the way. Notice that it wasn't called, he wasn't persecuting the belief. He was persecuting the way. The way, the practice of the original word, the original word as it was written. He was persecuting people who were following the example of Christ who lived a certain way, and that way was biblically. And what he had done, and what he was being trained in, was a tradition, right? A tradition that started off with good intentions to keep the Sabbath holy, and they built a system, oral law upon oral law upon oral, oral law, until the original intent of the simplicity of Torah, right, was done away with. And then Jesus talk to them about how hip, hypocritical that was and to get back to the simplicity of Torah and Jesus lived his the simplicity of Torah and this did not jive well with the traditions of the time right and so they were upset at this how dare he <clears throat> so they lived the way of the word made flesh they lived the way of the word. They saw the example. Well, Saul's religious leadership and his teachers became so hypocritical with their system that they built that they were willing to break commandment and murder, 
right? Those who are trying to live righteously. And we see that all the time, people in the name of God, right? Because they built up their systems. We have to be careful that we personally do not build up our system. We have to keep it simple. We have to keep it biblical, right? <clears throat> That's why we can't be so quick to judge Saul. He did believe he had a passion for God. He had God's law, but he idolized the system. He idolized the system. A religion of traditions and customs. And so we heard, we've heard the term, right, uh, to guard, you know, and to protect and to uh, keep the, what was once delivered to the saints, right? The truth is it was once delivered to the saints. Who was doing that originally? Jesus Christ was. Jesus Christ was. Because the system at that time, nobody knew God. They were making, and we'll read that later, they were making people, veering them into the ditch. Veering them into the ditch with the system. The word of God has always been battling corruption. Always been battling from day one. And it got to a head at the time of Jesus' first appearance. <clears throat> but let's see what James says in James in verse, uh, James chapter 1 and verse 27. Because he keeps it simple. James 1 and verse 27, he says, Pure and undefiled religion. Undefiled, meaning not corrupted. Pure and undefiled religion before God and the Father is this. He says, you want to impress God, the Father? Visit orphans and widows in their trouble. Take some action. Visit orphans and widows, people who are alone. Keep oneself unspotted for the world, from the world. Unspotted. Don't get involved with that. Don't get into these systems. Keep it simple, unspotted. That's the worldly things, right? Yet man has always been quick to defend their system and get all upset about it. I mean, Jesus Christ, what was he doing on the Sabbath that they were all upset about? He was healing. I mean, how hypocritical is that? <clears throat> For Paul, it's a direct revelation from God, right? It took direct revelation from God to let him know that he was blind and he literally was blinded for a time to let him know the world has been blinded too, right? And the world is going to take direct revelation from God. It's going to take direct revelation from God for the world to understand. But prior to that, the truth is going to be persecuted. The same way that Paul persecuted, the same way the people who think they're doing God a favor, persecuting people, right? Persecuting people who follow the simplicity of what the Bible says and only what the Bible says. These institutions, these institutions who claim the ones who are going to be doing is the claim, the people who claim inheritance somehow from Abraham, right? Whether it's Christians, Jews, Muslims, they all claim some inheritance through Abraham. And yet all are going to be willing to kill for their spilt up system. <clears throat> so the question is, how are you going to believe? How are you going to believe to make sure you're not deceived by these systems, by these things? Will God find faith on the earth? That's the question, right? How can you protect yourself? Well, let's turn to what Jesus has to say about this subject in John 8 and verse 12. John 8 and verse 12. In John 8 and verse 12, he speaks out in a loud voice and he says, I am the light of the world. He who follows me shall not walk in darkness, but have the light of life. He who follows me, right, shall not walk in darkness. Is the world walking in the light of life? Do we see that out there? Or do we see it more and more slipping into darkness, sin, lawlessness, death, right? We don't see that. So the world is obviously not following light. Somehow the light of life. <clears throat> Are you following the same steps as Jesus Christ? Because that's the simplicity. That's the light that he's talking about. To follow his simplicity. Are you blazing your own spiritual trail like the world does? Because now you can build your own system easy. You can get on YouTube. You can find this and say, oh, I believe that. You can go to the other one. I believe that. And you make your own hodgepodge of a system. Of a system. <clears throat> But is it biblical? 
Is it biblical? Is it the life? Is it reflected in the life of Jesus Christ? So in John 8, when Jesus starts explaining this and he says, I'm the light of life, the Pharisees basically say to him, who do you think you are? You didn't come to the, from the Father as you claim to have come from the Father. As a matter of fact, we know Mary and we know who your father is, right? And we weren't born of sin, so they try to get him on that. They didn't think Mary was a virgin. They said, we know who your father is. But Jesus keeps his calm. And what he explains here is, is rather fascinating. I find it very fascinating because he starts to explain to him everything, to them everything before it happens. He talks about that he's going to be resurrected and then they're going to know that it's him. Mm. <clears throat> but he says it in the way they still don't quite understand. But he says, and then unless, then they'll believe. And unless they believe, they're going to all die in their sins. I mean, it's powerful words he tells them next. But let's read how, how it happens here. In John 8 and verse 23. John 8 and verse 23. He says, you are from beneath, I am from above, you are of this world, I am not of this world. Imagine that he's telling these, these leaders, religious leaders, I am not of this world. He says, therefore I said to you that you will die in your sins, for if you do not believe that I am he, you will die in your sins. They must be like, what is this guy talking about? He's right here, he's claiming he is the redeemer. He is the Messiah. You will die in your sins. The Lamb of God. Then he said to him, then they said to him, who are you? And Jesus said to them, just what I've been saying to you from the beginning. I have many things to say and to judge concerning you, but he who has sent me is true. I speak to the world those things which I heard from him. The words of Jesus Christ come from the Father, and the Father is speaking to the entire world. He's not just speaking to these Pharisees here in Judea. He's not speaking to only the first fruits. He's speaking to the world that Jesus Christ speaks for his father. And he says, <clears throat> they did, and it says, they did not understand that he spoke to them of the father. Then Jesus said to them, when you lift up the son of man, then you will know that I am he and that I do nothing of myself, but as my father taught me, I speak these things and he who sent me is with me, which I think is beautiful. He who sent me is with me. The father has not left me alone. And we talked about this when he was praying, right, in the garden. He was not alone. The Father has left me, not left me alone. But look at the next line here. Why is that? For I always do those things that please him. Right? If you give an effort to do those things that please the Father, he will never leave you. Right? If you do those things that Jesus said, which are the same things his Father says, because he says nothing that his Father hasn't said, he will never leave you. He will never leave you. Right? <clears throat> That's how you abide. That's how you live in Jesus Christ, by keeping his word. He will never leave you. Is the, is the world imitating Christ? Are they doing what pleases God? Are we? <clears throat> now, that's a lot for people to take in. What he said, he revealed a lot of truth there to people who may not just, they're not prepared for this, right? And we know that after the resurrection, Thomas said, I, I won't believe until I see it. But this is even before, the, this is before the crucifixion. And yet there were people who were believers in what Jesus Christ was saying. Why? Because Jesus' actions were not hypocritical, right? His action was where his belief was. He was obedient to the Father and he wasn't a hypocrite. And so people, when he said this, they believed him and they saw the powerful miracles. And look at verse 30. As he spoke these words, many believed him. So there were people there who believed without having seen yet. They're kind of like us because we believe and we didn't see Jesus in the resurrect, but we believe. They were kind of like us. So let's pay attention to what Jesus has to say on how to believe because the next verse he starts to explain it. in verse 31. Then Jesus said to those Jews who believed him, he's talking to believers now, <clears throat> if, which is conditional, right? It's conditional. If you abide in my word, what does abide mean? Abide means to take up residence, to live there. In other words, you continue in his word, you will continue obeying, obeying, so much so that you live there in his word. If you abide in my word, you make your home there. You are my disciples indeed. You're my true followers. Indeed. 
Not just that you say you're my disciples, you're indeed my disciples. And you shall know the truth, and the truth shall make you free. Right? You see, you, you want to keep his word the same way he kept his father's word, because you're keeping his father's word by doing that. You're going back to the simplicity of the word of God as it was laid out. That's what he's saying to you here. That is believing. He's explaining what believing is. Notice that belief, knowledge, truth, they're all conditional on taking that action, on keeping that word. <clears throat> it's behavioral. If you want to know God, then you have to act like him, right? You want to know what he's about? Act like him. You have the best example in Jesus Christ. <clears throat> You want to know the truth? Act like the truth. <clears throat> and God will set you free, he says. What does he set you free from? He sets you free from sin. Amen. He sets you free from sin and death, the consequence of sin. He doesn't set you free from the law, right? Because that wouldn't make sense according to what Jesus Christ pleased God. He says, God never left me alone because I do what pleases him. He never broke the law, not once. He was lawful. So he does not do away with law. He does away with sin and death, the consequence of law breaking. And that's why if you abide in him, he's willing to forgive. He's merciful. He's the just one. He will forgive you, but you need to try to make your home there. You need to try to make your home there. <clears throat> he says if you want to, okay, so let's hear, let's hear it in verse 34. Jesus, what does he say in verse 34? Jesus answered them, Most assuredly, I say to you, whoever commits sin is a slave of sin. So you notice when he says commit sin, slave of sin, you're not a slave of one sin. You're a slave if you keep doing it over and over and over again. That's the commit. If you practice sin, in other words, if you keep doing that, you're a slave of sin. And a slave does not abide in the house forever. You see, you can't live in God's house forever. You can't live in his body. You can't live in his kingdom that he's made open to you forever. If you're a slave, he says, but a son abides forever. Therefore, if the son makes you free, you shall be free indeed. Okay, the son can forgive you, but you got to abide and he has to abide in you, right? And that's how you're set free from sin, not from the law. The law is showing you how to live right so that you can abide in, so that they can never leave you. They're willing to forgive you, but you can't trample that underfoot. You can't take that for granted and say, it's forget about the law. That doesn't make sense to the person who pleased God by being a law keeper, right? So this is, this is we're beginning to get from Jesus himself how to believe. What is belief in order to see, in order to see God? <clears throat> and he says one of two things. Number one, you have to believe that it's Jesus Christ is the redeemer, right? That he has to redeem you from your sins. And then number two, we go a step further. We abide in him because when we live in him, his life conquers death, Right? His life conquered death because he never sinned. So when we live in him, we conquer death too. We live eternally. We conquer the curse of the law, which is death, not the law itself. All right? So he, he sets a clear path to follow. You choose to live forever in his family, or you choose to practice sin, be a slave of that, and die in your sins. And he's making it just plain and simple. And I can go through a litany of, let's go through a flurry of quotes of John 8 to show that it's about action and it's about doing. It's not just a matter of believing something, but how do you believe? Verse 39, if you were Abraham's children and all these religions think they are, you would do the works of Abraham. See, you would do the works of Abraham. Verse 47, he who is of God Here's God's words, therefore you do not hear because you are not of God. And that word hears God's words, it's more like heeds. It's more like hears and responds. You do something if you hear God's words. Most assuredly, I say to you in verse 51, in verse 51, if anyone keeps my word, he shall never see death. Keep it, obey it, do it. You're not going to see death. Verse 55, 
Yet you have not known him, but I know him, speaking of the Father. And if I say I do not know him, I shall be a liar like you. But I do know him and keep his word. How many people claim to know Jesus Christ? Do they keep his word? He says he knows his father and he keeps his word. And he's not said anything that his father hasn't said. He hasn't contradicted his father. Did he ever say, I contradict my father? Or does he say, I only say what the father tells me? Right? But people will claim that Jesus Christ did exactly that, contradict his father. Right? No more law. I don't think so. <clears throat> Jesus wants us to believe in this way. If we want to see God, if we want to see spiritual truth, or we just want to be a spiritual tourist, keep doing what you want to do. You want to see spiritual truth, you need to believe in the way that Jesus Christ is explaining to you. All right? Because Jesus Christ, and it's sad that he has to say it in Matthew 23 and verse 15. That whole section, Matthew 23, I'm just pointing out verse 15 here. But the whole section is about what's wrong with religious systems and the hypocrisy. And he says, woe to you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites, for you travel land and sea to win a prosel one proselyte, and when he's one, you make him twice as much a son of hell as yourself. That's pretty harsh. That's pretty harsh. But why is that? Because when you try to make a system, all you're doing is you're veering somebody off the course of truth and simplicity right into a ditch. No matter which way you turn, no matter what that system is. He's just telling you the truth. He's not going to lie to you. He's telling you the truth. You make the person the child of the grave, of sin and death. That's what hell is, the grave, death. Why, and what is death? How is death brought about? Through sin, through breaking of commandments. You can't just make a system and think you're going to break a commandment. Jesus Christ never did that. You're not following the light if that's how you live. <clears throat> and yet we'll, we see that we hear that same hypocritical nonsense but from another spectrum about we're free from the law, right? Pharisees, they made a bunch of laws that were counter to God's ways. And then Christianity continues that. I mean, in one sense, Catholicism, they built their own system, right, of the laws and a bunch of laws. And, and they take Roman holidays and they say, oh, yeah, well, now we'll do this and forget about God's holy days, Right. And then there was a breakaway, there was a push against that, and you have Protestantism and Evangelical, and you have a lot of it today is, well, forget about the whole, forget about the law. Forget about the law. So they go to another extreme, but it's all an invented system. And it's not the simplicity of what the Bible says and what Jesus Christ lived. It's not the simplicity of the written word and the word made flesh that was then made spirit and should live in, right? It's not that simplicity. <clears throat> Now, some Christians will tell you, well, after Paul came, you know, after Jesus came, Paul. So Jesus was speaking to the Jews, but Paul was speaking to the Gentiles. So really, Paul is really who you should be listening to. Just the way, as if Jesus contradicted God. They think Paul contradicted Jesus, right? Because they're making a covenant, not with God, with themselves to justify the way they want to live. This is why they say these things. Because Paul never contradicted Jesus Christ. Right? Is it true biblically that the folks after Jesus Christ ever said that you can live the way you want? Or did they say you got to keep yourself spotless and clean and live lawfully? Let's, let's explore after Jesus Christ to see if that's true. Hebrews 3 and verse 12. Hebrews 3 and verse 12. Beware, brethren. He's talking to... Christians here after Jesus Christ, the resurrection and everything. I'm talking to Christians. Lest there be any of you, <clears throat> any of you, an evil found in you, an evil heart of unbelief in departing from the living God. Unbelief, it says here, in departing from God. He's talking to Christians. Don't be found unbelieving in departing from God. He says, but exhort one another daily. Encourage one another daily. That's why I said that in the beginning here. Let's pray for our brethren who are not here today. Pray for them. While it is called today, lest any of you be hardened through the deceitfulness of sin. People want to play around and say, no, law is not necessary. They're playing around with the deceitfulness of sin. <clears throat> this, which is always the, the battle. 
For we have become partakers of Christ, partakers of Christ. We're, you know, we're, we're taking, Passover's coming up, right? Partakers of Christ, of the word, of the manna from heaven, right? If another conditional, just like Jesus Christ, right? Conditional, if we hold the beginning of our confidence steadfast all the way to the end, till you drop dead, till you take your last breath. If you hold it to the end, then you can be partakers of Christ. Today, if while it is said today, if you hear his voice, do not harden your hearts as in the rebellion. For who having heard rebelled? Indeed, was it not all who came out of Egypt led by Moses? Now listen to this, folks. You've come out of Egypt led by Jesus Christ. Okay? There's a parallel here. Now with whom was he angry for 40 years? Was it not those who sinned, whose corpses fell in the wilderness? And to whom did he swear that they would not enter his rest, but the, to those who did not obey? These are profound words here. He's drawing a parallel. Those people didn't enter to the rest of the promised land. They were led by Moses. And he's speaking to Christians now. What do you think he's saying? You want to enter into God's promised kingdom of God? Right? You want to enter into that? Then don't enter into unbelief, which is those who dropped before they got to their rest place did not obey. Right? And by the way, how did they not obey those 40 years? Wasn't it oftentimes when they didn't keep the Sabbath properly? Wasn't that true? Because this section of Hebrews, by the way, is about Sabbath keeping as well. It's very interesting. And look at what it says in verse 19. So we see that they could not enter in because of unbelief. Verse 18 and 19 is the key right here. Unbelief is equated with disobedience, which means to believe the right way to believe in order to see God is to obey. That is what it is to believe God, to obey God. It's right here. It's, it's the biblical definition of what belief is, in case anybody wants to tell you otherwise. <clears throat> so that's Hebrews. What does James have to say? Because James is after Jesus Christ. Let's see what James has to say in James 1, verse 16. Do not be deceived, my beloved brethren. Every good gift and every perfect gift is from above and comes down from the Father of lights with whom there is no variation or shadow of turning. That's a beautiful line right there, right? He's not gonna, it's not a system where there's a little bit of sin in there, it's okay. There's no shadow of turning from the light giver, right? On his own will, he, of his own will, he brought us forth by the word of God that we might be a kind of first fruits of his creation. What a privilege, right? What a privilege for the first fruits not like the rest of the harvest later on that they're going to see God, they're going to see to believe. We have a privilege, a special privilege here. And so then how should we live? Verse 19. So then, my beloved brethren, let every man be swift to hear, swift to hear, slow to speak. You know, stop yapping away about what you're going to do and how you're going to do it. and blah, blah. It's already written down. We don't need to hear you speak about it. Slow to wrath. How many people are always all angry about something or other? Angry about something or other. For the wrath of man does not produce the righteousness of God. That's what we see. We see religions out there that duke it out. They duke it out. They fight it out. Whatever. How well do they know Jesus Christ? <clears throat> Therefore lay aside all filthiness and overflow of wickedness and receive with meekness the implanted word. That's a beautiful visual right there, right? With humility, receive the implanted word. Where is that implanted? Where is that seed placed? Right in your heart, right? It's planted in your heart to grow one day into something beautiful, <clears throat> which is able to save your souls, but be doers of the words and not hearers only, deceiving yourself, right? Yes. Doers. For if anyone is a hearer of the word and not a doer, he's like a man, observing his natural face in a mirror. For he observes himself and goes away and immediately forget what, he, what kind of man he was. Right? But he who looks into the perfect law of liberty, he's comparing the law to a mirror. 
Is he not doing that right here? He who looks into the perfect law of, of liberty, if you see dirt on your face through the mirror, do you get rid of the dirt or do you get rid of the mirror? Mm -hmm. Christianity wants to get rid of the mirror these days. No more law. No, wash your face. Amen. <clears throat> and before you know it, you're washing your brother's feet on Passover, right? Perfect law of liberty and continues in it, continues in it, and is not a forgetful hearer, but a doer of the word. That's not just the, you know, continues, again, practice. <clears throat> This one will be blessed in what he does. If anyone among you thinks he's religious and does not bridle his tongue, but deceives his own heart, his religion, this one's religion is useless. Again, people just want to talk, 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 yap, 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 yap. They get involved with the world. They want to talk about Republicans are doing this and the Democrats are doing that and the rich people this and the poor people that and the Catholic this or the whatever. I know good people everywhere. All right? It's not their time yet. It's not their appointed time. God is working with them. God will work with them. He died for everybody to have a chance. Okay? But people just get involved and they just get in the middle of things that they should not get into. You're a Christian. Yes. Live according to the simplicity of the Bible. You're not going to save anybody. Jesus Christ will save. Okay? Your religion, your politics, your systems are not going to do nothing for nobody. Jesus Christ will. <clears throat> Again, we read what we read before. Pure and undefiled religion before God and the Father is this. You want to be impressive to the Father? Visit orphans and widows in their trouble. Pick up a phone call. Somebody's not here. Somebody's sick. Pick, pick up a phone call. Make a phone call. How you feeling today? You all right? How you doing? Impress the Father. And keep, and to keep oneself unspotted for the world, from the world. Unspotted. So he's talking about the law does this jive with what Jesus said about the law and about pleasing the Father? This was after Jesus, right? Let's look at Jude. Jude, what scholarship says, was written in 68 AD, almost 40 years after the crucifixion, right? Jude 1 and verse 3. Jude 1 and verse 3. Beloved, while I was very diligent to write to you concerning our common salvation, I found it necessary to write to you, exhorting you to contend earnestly for the faith which was once delivered to the saints, right? Same thing Jesus was doing, we said. Same thing Jesus, he's, he's still got to be fighting. 40 years later, they're still fighting it out for the simplicity of the word of God. For certain men have crept in unnoticed long ago who were marked out for this condemnation, ungodly men, who turned the grace of God into lewdness. Lewdness. Which is what? Which is lawlessness, Right? and deny the only Lord God and our Lord Jesus Christ. People, it's not just about that people physically deny this is not Jesus Christ, but you, when, you, when you say yes, grace, Jesus is grace, but then your actions are nothing but immoral and lawless, you in effect, you deny Jesus Christ. You deny him. You deny him of him being the redeemer who died for you not to live that way, but to live according to his example. You deny him, you trample him underfoot. And this is also what is meant by denying him here. <clears throat> but again, this is people whose belief of grace justified their immoral lifestyle, okay? Not just, and he's warning you, Jew, what does Peter have to say? Does Peter get into this? Does he contradict Jesus Christ somehow? 2 Peter 1, verse 16. 2 Peter 1, verse 16. For we did not follow cunningly devised fables. Remember we talked about the world thinks this is all a bunch of morality tales, right? That the Bible's nothing but a bunch of... We did not follow cunningly devised fables when we made known to you the power and the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ, but we were eyewitnesses of his majesty. They saw... And they believed. You better believe what they, they saw and believed. For he received from God the Father honor and glory. When such a voice came to him from the excellent glory, this is my beloved son in whom I am well pleased. 
and when and we heard this voice from which came from heaven and when we were with him on the holy mountain they didn't just see it they heard it for themselves just like Israel did back in the day and the, what a what a marvelous thing to see right a confirmation of everything it's so true and they saw the future and they saw Jesus Christ and they saw him glorified and they saw Moses and Elijah and they said wow they said, we're not talking about fables here, folks. We know what we saw and we know what we heard. And the father said he was well pleased with his son. Why? Because he lived lawlessly and contradictory to what the father said? Or because he lived lawfully and according to what pleased the father? <clears throat> and so it says, and so we have the prophetic word confirmed. He's confirming the Bible, confirming it, which you do well to heed as a light that shines in a dark place, look at this beautiful line, until the day dawns and the morning star rises in your heart, right? That implanted word, that implanted seed, glorification, just like Jesus Christ, he says, until that day, until that day, heed, heed, knowing this first, and what are we going to heed now? Knowing this first, that no prophecy of scripture is of any private interpretation, for prophecy never came by the will of man, but holy men of God spoke as they were moved by the Holy Spirit. They said, they confirm the word of God. They confirm it. But then what? He says, another, 2 Peter 2. But they were also false prophets among the people. They were, all, they were past tense. There were also false prophets. And then he says, even as there will be false teachers among you, future tense, who will secretly bring in destructive heresies, even denying the Lord who bought them who bought them and bring on themselves with swift destruction. He's saying, there's always going to be people like this. We confirm the truth, but there's always going to be people. And, and what are these heresies? You know what? When he says who bought them, Christ is our redeemer. But how many times do you even hear a Christian say, right? Well, he was like, he was a good man. You know, Buddha was a good man too, Krishna, whatever. And that's really Christ consciousness or whatever it is. No, when you talk about all religions, talk about the same God, no. no. You deny our Redeemer, the guy who bought you, the God who bought you, through a sinless life, through a lawful life, through a lawful life. And it says in verse 2, and many, not a few, many will follow these destru their destructive ways because of whom the way of truth will be blasphemed. By covetousness, they will exploit you with deceptive words. For a long time, their judgment has not been idle, and destruction does not slumber. The devil has not slept trying to corrupt the word of God, so you don't sleep, right? By covetousness. Covetousness is, is, goes both ways. People try to covet you to follow you through a certain system, and they want followers, and they want your money, or whatever it is. But also, people want to buy what they're selling. Because they maybe they're selling prosperity. They're selling all the good life here. Blah, blah, blah. Through whatever gospel they're preaching to you to turn you into a ditch. But you know what? It's not all about prosperity. It's about endurance to the end. We read that. Endurance to the end. Overcoming. Overcoming. Hardship. Why? Because we know it's at the end. And we're not going to turn away from the simplicity of the truth. And it says here, 2 Peter chapter 3, 2 Peter chapter 3 and verse 1. Beloved, I now write to you this second epistle, second time now, and both of which I store, you, I store up your pure minds, see the ones that are not, not defiled, by way of a reminder, that you may be mindful of the words which were spoken before the, by the holy prophets and of the, and of the commandment of us, the apostles of the Lord and Savior. What is he saying? Be mindful, keep in mind the word of God, the Bible, the scriptures. Keep that in mind. That's how you stay a believer. Because if you need to obey to believe, then you need to know what you're obeying, right? Keep the scriptures in your mind. Knowing this first, scoffers will come in the last day, walking according to their own lusts, saying, where's the promise of his coming? Since the fathers fell asleep, all things continue as they were from the beginning of creation. Look at these people. First of all, that sounds like today, nowadays, right? And it says the fathers fell asleep. These are Christians who could say these things too. We heard James talk about how these Christians now accept evolution. 
Many Christians today tell you, Jesus Christ isn't coming back. He's a good guy and everything. He's not coming back, though. That's just, you know, it's 2,000 years. Right? Yes. But what about us? In verse 13. In verse 13. But according to his promise, we are waiting for new heavens and a new earth in which righteousness truly resides. They want to have the righteousness their way, they can have it. But we're waiting for the new heavens and the new earth. And in the meantime, we'll keep to the truth. Thank you. Remember when Jesus said, not one jot or one tittle will pass away until the new heavens and the new earth? Well, guess what? Peter went here. We're still waiting. And we're still waiting. We're still waiting for that. And people will, will tell you, yeah, well, Jesus Christ, he finished it. He did it all at the cross. Folks, Passover is holiday, holy day number one. Yeah. Is the beginning of the plan. Okay? But that's what happens when you're worshiping a baby Jesus, Christmas, or a dying Jesus, Easter, baby Jesus, dying Jesus. We have a living Jesus Christ that we worship. Okay? We have a living Jesus Christ that we worship. Okay? And people, let me tell you something. This is truth. There are people out there all over the world, okay, who are keeping the holy days. Why? Because the Bible says so. Just plain and simple, because the Bible says so. And oftentimes, the church will tell you, they'll call up the church and say, hey, listen, we found you. We were doing the same thing. Can we join you? And we say yes. And we will get people in that way. Because there's a living Jesus Christ who's still calling people. We're still calling first fruits people to follow the truth, right? The simple truth. And when we obey, then we begin to see. We begin to see, we believe and we see beautiful things, beautiful visions that help us get through the grind. We don't need a different system to help us soothe us and our itching ears. We need the truth, okay? And we need the power of the Holy Spirit that comes with the truth. There's nothing more powerful than that. <clears throat> Verse 14, therefore, beloved, looking forward to these things, right? Still waiting for the new heavens and the earth. Be diligent to be found by him in peace. You know what? You want to be a son of God? The sons, the sons of, you know, the peacemakers will be called sons of God. You can't be all angry and upset and with your brother and with the politics. Please, get over it. Right? Peace. Without spot and blameless. Without spot and blameless. Does that sound contradictory to Jesus Christ? And consider that the long suffering of our Lord is salvation. As also our beloved Paul as also Paul, right, according to the wisdom given to him, Paul was directly, had direct revelation from Jesus Christ himself. That's the wisdom given to Paul. And Paul, Paul lived, you know, when he was given direct revelation, what did he do? Did he live a lawless life? Or did he live one of obedience, patience, long-suffering, endurance? That's what Paul did. Paul grinded. Grinded, grind, 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 grind lawfully. He wasn't contradictory to Jesus Christ. <clears throat> it says in verse 16, as also in all his epistles, which Paul's letters make up much of the New Testament, does it not? All his epistles, speaking in them of these things, of what? Of being spotless and blameless. In which we are, are some things are hard to understand, which untaught, unstable people twist to their own destruction as they do the rest of the scriptures. People are ignorant, of the simplicity of what's written. They don't even bother to read it. You'll see Bibles that are really New Testaments that doesn't even include the Old Testament. They don't know what they're talking about because they only know half of it, the half of it. And they think one half contradicts the other. So they think the other half isn't worthy. How dare they? How dare they split the word of God and God that way? <clears throat> Everything about traditions, nothing about overcoming. You walk the walk that all of these folks, after Jesus Christ walked, and that's how you believe. That's how you stay in the truth. That's how you don't get mixed up in these religions that are going to be battling it out together on this planet. That's how you stay true. Peter continues in verse 17. You therefore, beloved, since you know this beforehand, beware lest you fall from your own steadfastness, being led away in the error of the wicked. You want to do it the way, away with the law and say it's okay to be sinful? Good luck to you. 
That's error. But grow in the grace and knowledge of our Lord Jesus Christ. To him be the glory both now and forever. You know I love that term, grow in the grace and knowledge of Jesus Christ. You know why I love that term so much, right? Because the know you more, the know, the more you know about Jesus Christ, the more you know about God, the more you know about his truth, the more you know how little you are. The more you know how of, of, of a grain of sin, you're just so small and you're just so far from his perfection. And you know what God has to do there? He has to let you know, hey, don't worry about it. I got even more grace for you. I got more knowledge, but I got more grace for you too, right? Amen. Grow in the grace and knowledge. How beautiful is that? Really, it's growing in the knowledge and the grace. <clears throat> it's just a beautiful thing. That's the just one. We worship a just. That's even more than just. It's more than fair to us. That's a loving father, right? So let's go back to where we started. Acts 22, Acts 22 and verse 12. Acts 22 and verse 12. Then a certain Ananias, a devout man according to the law, having a good testimony with all the Jews who dwelt there. See, someone who obeyed God. He was a Jew, but he obeyed God. Came to me and he stood and said to me, Brother Saul, receive your sight. And at that same hour, I looked up at him. Then he said, the God of our fathers has chosen you that you should know his will and see the just one. And hear the voice of his mouth. See the just one. Right? How beautiful is that? The first fruits, first fruits are chosen to believe, to believe in the way. Right? Which means to obey the way. And then you will see that just one. Right? You will see that justice. You will see that beautiful eighth day. You will see his holy days. You will see. But you have to obey. You have to obey. And it says here, for you, in verse 15, for you will be his witness to all men of what you have seen and heard. And now why are you waiting? Arise and be baptized. Wash away your sins, calling on the name of the Lord. Okay? We're getting into Passover season. Mr. Davis talked about baptism last week. He's going to have another sermon on baptism. What are you waiting for? Amen. Arise and be baptized. Wash away the sins. Call, calling. Calling is a continuous thing. It's like an action, right? Calling, keep calling. Oh, God, protect me, help me, be with me, be with my family, always praying. Calling on the name of the Lord after your baptism. Just constant calling. Paul had his system, but God has a, had other plans for him. God has other plans for us, right? He has other plans for us. Walking the way of scripture is walking the way of Jesus Christ. Believing is walking is obeying. And then we see all these beautiful truths. And so let me finish up with 1 Corinthians 2 verse 9. 1 Corinthians 2 verse 9. I shouldn't say 1 Corinthians, it's 1 Corinthians. All right, does it really matter that much? <laughs> All right, 1 Corinthians 2, verse 9. But as it is written, I has not seen, nor ear heard, nor have entered into the heart of man the things which God has prepared for those who love him. What a beautiful line, right? But what's even more beautiful than this, the next line? But God has revealed them to us through his spirit. For the spirit searches all things, yes, the deep things of God. So read that first line again. Eye has not seen, no, your eyes are beginning to see. That's the beauty of it. Ear, nor ear heard, no, your ears are hearing. Not through what I'm saying, I'm quoting the Bible. I'm quoting the simplicity. Nor have entered into the heart of man. That implanted word is there, implanted until it dawns on that day, it says, right? Implanted the things which God has prepared for those you love him. Now you know he loves you. So now you love him back and you believe. And you believe in order to see. 